If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 6. We're going to have a short little Bible reading here. It's going to be verses 35 through 69. So just short. Don't worry about it. Uh, (laughs) uh, We'll be reading a a lot of verses here. Uh, I am not going to break down every single phrase and word. So, you know, you you don't have to worry. We won't be here till 6 o'clock tonight. But it is a longer passage that we'll be reading. So uh, John chapter 6, looking at verses 35 through 69. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him, because he had said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I've come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they all will be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. Not that every, not that everyone has seen the father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for for the life of the world is my flesh." The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you can have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, You take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning Though who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it's granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for even this longer section, but just the meat that's here, the, the, the deep teachings that are here. I pray that you would help us for the next few moments to, uh, to, to set aside the distractions of the world, the distractions of life in general, and focus on what your word says. I pray that you would challenge us. I pray that you would encourage us. Uh, point us toward yourself, Lord, I pray. Help us to prepare our hearts as we, as we observe the Lord's Supper after the message. But I just pray that through this time, we would be preparing ourselves. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So today we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper. 
Uh, we, we have the little pieces of bread. I, I, uh, one of our church members, he actually bakes unleavened bread for us. So it's, it's not the little crackers. It's, uh, well, they're, they're crackers, but they're, <laughs> they're homemade crackers. So that's good. Uh, we, have, we have the grape juice. Um, we, we celebrate the Lord's Supper. It's a somber celebration. If you've been here any length of time, you've heard me say this before I use this phrase, a somber celebration. It's not something you hear very often in our, in our culture. Somber, mourning, sadness, celebration, you know, levity. They don't seem to go together, except they do. We can have a somber celebration. We can rejoice that Jesus provided a way, the only way of restoration of God. We can, that's something to celebrate. There's a way of salvation. But we also must never forget that the way of salvation was secured with Jesus' broken body and shed blood. This wasn't bought cheaply. Think of perhaps a, a birthday party where somebody gives you a gift and you realize they got it from the dollar store. Ah, thanks. You know, this was not purchased cheaply. So we can celebrate the joy of salvation but also somberly understanding that this came through the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ. In this passage from John chapter 6, Jesus makes it abundantly clear that he is the bread of life. He uses these statements, I am the bread of life. Apart from him, there's nothing but starvation and death. And that's, I mean, that's really the way he sets this up. There's a dichotomy. Uh, with Christ, there's the bread of life. There's food, there's abundance. Apart from Christ, there's starvation, there's spiritual death. There is no middle ground. You know, we live in a world of choices, uh, especially when it comes to food. Uh, we, we live in a world where food is easy. Calories are easy to get. Most of us, our New Year's resolution is to lose a little weight, right? Uh, not that anyone here needs to. I know I, I do, though. Um, I've been trying to lose the same 20 pounds for the past 20 years. It's, it's terrible. But calories are cheap. If I don't want to go to this restaurant, I can go to that restaurant down the, down the street. It's easy peasy. You know, I got all these choices. When it comes to spiritual food, the way Christ says it, the way Christ presents it, there are no choices, He's the, the source of food. He's the source of nourishment. The alternative is nothing. It's death. Earlier in the chapter, Jesus feeds 5,000 people. Actually, the way it's, it's worded in John 6, there's 5,000 men. There were probably women and children there too. Maybe not as many children as you'd think, but there were, there were probably more than 5,000, just specifically 5,000 men, and Jesus feeds them miraculously. They're, they're there. They've been listening to him teach, and... Uh, it's getting late. They're too far out to go home. There's no restaurants around. You know, Taco Bell hasn't been invented yet. So they're, they're hungry. The disciples say, hey, the people, are, the people are hungry. What are we going to do? And Jesus says, well, feed them. With what? And they find, they find a, a, a one small child. There was like one kid in the crowd that thought ahead. Maybe his mom thought ahead. And he's got a little lunch pail full of just a little bit of food for himself. And Jesus turns that into a meal for everyone. The apostles, the disciples are allowed to participate in, in feeding this crowd. And uh, they have this miraculous moment. This crowd, uh, much of the crowd remains with Jesus after they stay the night. They remain there waiting for more miracles. Perhaps they were, they're waiting for more food. It's like a dinner show. Uh, we got food. We got this miracle. It's like a, it's, it's entertainment. And I, and I don't doubt that many thought of it that way. And at this point, Jesus makes this first I am statement. Now, the book of John, the gospel of John, is built on seven miraculous acts of Jesus and seven I am statements. And this is the first one. He says, I am the bread of life. This, uh, this word I am, with this declaration, Jesus is establishing himself as the God of the Old Testament the God that the Israelites worshipped. Remember when, when Moses, who was going to deliver Israel from Egypt, God tells him to go and, he sa and Moses says, who, who am I supposed to tell them sent me? And God reveals his name. Tell them, I am sent you. I am that I am. The one who is. That's God's name. And Jesus is, in Greek, it's ego ami. Doesn't necessarily matter to you guys, but that's the Greek expression. 
It's equivalent. Jesus is tying himself to the God of the Old Testament. Jesus is overt and explicit in his statement. When he says, I am the bread of life, okay, that makes it, okay, I get that. And then he goes in, well, you got to eat my body, you got to drink my flesh. And as we read through that, I guarantee if there was anyone here that hasn't read that very often, maybe it was the first time you heard it, you're sitting there like, what? What's, what's he saying here, right? I, I mean, some of you, I won't, I won't ask for a show of hands. But even some of you who have read this multiple times, that's one of those passages you kind of, we're just going to let that go. We're going to read it and move forward, right? Because he's explicit. He's, he's almost graphic in talking about, you got to eat my flesh. you got to drink my blood to have eternal life. He's so graphic that most of the crowd abandons him. It's just too much. And we probably all had a situation like that where something was just too much. No, I'm out. I'm out of this. So as we prepare to take the, the, the bread and the cup a little bit later, I want to pull out three truths from this passage. Again, we're not going to completely unpack it. That would take days and days. But I want to I lift three truths from this passage to help us prepare spiritually for the Lord's table. So the first truth that we see in, in uh, verse 35 here, uh, Jesus is the source of life and health. This is the first truth. Jesus is the source of life and, and health. Jesus is no mystic guru who knows the arcane path to enlightenment. We, we see this in TV shows and pop culture. Uh, people follow, the and, and maybe even in, in other religions, people follow the guru, the yogi, or whatever the, whatever the religious leader's name is because he knows the mystical path. If you follow my, or maybe if you watch TV late at night, the, uh, the, the late night infomercials, the guy, you know, if you follow my 18-step program, Jesus, that's not what Jesus is. He's not a mystic guru. He's not a gatekeeper who guards the way, who's selling his book for the low price of 1999. That's not what Jesus is doing. Jesus isn't guarding the way. He is the way. This is the point of the I am statements. So Jesus says, I am the bread of life, and this is a spiritual reality. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. This statement presupposes that people are hungry and thirsty, right? I mean, if you come up to somebody and say, hey, you'll never hunger and never thirst, but you've never been hungry or never been thirsty, you have no idea what they're talking about. Like, what does that mean? So there's a presupposition that we are hungry and thirsty. And then we know that physically we all need food and water for life. You know, that's, that's something that we grasp. But Jesus is speaking of something much, much deeper here. Not just a physical need, but a spiritual need. There's a spiritual, there's an eternal hunger and thirst that we all have. And again, this is just as real and recognizable as a physical hunger. Uh, if you miss breakfast, I try to always get up and I try to get breakfast by, because by, like on a Sunday especially, by about 11 o'clock, you, you start to hear my stomach growl through the microphone. So I try to always make sure I get breakfast in. But if you skip breakfast, there comes a point when you're like, hmm, yeah, I need to eat something. Uh, if, you don't, if you've been outside and you've been sweating and you, know, you feel that thirst, you, you, it's, it's, it's undeniable. But our spiritual hunger, our spiritual thirst is just as undeniable. You know it. We might not understand fully what it is. This world certainly doesn't, but they feel it. We see it in our relentless search for meaning, our relentless search for purpose in life. Even atheists seek purpose and meaning, all while denying the one who gives purpose and meaning. Richard Dawkins, my favorite, my, he's my, my favorite atheist. I, 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 lo I love talking about Richard Dawkins because he's, he's one of the few atheists who will he'll be blunt. He's, he's relatively honest as far as atheists go, but he's known because he writes books. He writes lots of books. He's made lots of money debunking the reality of God. But why is this man who believes, he literally believes we're space dust. 
We're purposeless, we're pointless, we're here, we're a cosmic accident, we have no reason to be here, but yet he feels the need to write books correcting my theology. Well, why? Because he's striving for relevance, he's striving for purpose, he's got to have a purpose, even while he denies the existence of purpose. But we see this in, in, in all, all through our world, people striving. Honestly, why do you think there's such a huge drug epidemic in our society? Even out in rural areas like, like Indiana here, we have this huge drug issue. Well, because people feel like they're without purpose. They feel hollow. They feel empty. Got to fill that emptiness with something. So we recognize it. We know there's a eternal, a spiritual hunger. There's an eternal spiritual thirst that we all have. And Jesus says he's the one who can fill that. Paul explains this spiritual hunger in his letter to the Romans. And these are two verses that you probably are very familiar with. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We've broken God's law, we've sinned, we've become separated from the God of creation, the source of life, the source of hope, the one who gives purpose. We're separated from him. That was the, uh, that was the warning that God gave Adam in the Garden of Eden. The day you eat the piece of fruit, you will die. Now, he didn't die physically. He died spiritually. He was separated from God spiritually. And one by one, we always talk about, you know, Adam and Eve became sinners. They had children. Well, what did they have? They had little sinners. Dogs, you know, two dogs produce baby dogs. Two cats produce baby cats. Two sinners produce baby sinners. So we find ourselves born with this, this sin nature, this separation from the source of hope. Romans 3, uh, 6, 23 says that the, the wages of our sin is death, is separation, but the gift of God is eternal life. There's, a, there's hope. There is an answer. And we're searching for it. Our sin nature makes us search in all the wrong places, but there is an answer. We come into the world separated from the source of life, but God offers life through his son. So that's a spiritual reality. The Jews that were listening to Jesus or the Israelites that were listening to Jesus were having trouble separating the eternal from the temporal. This idea of an eternal bread, this bread of life, this spiritual bread, they, they really couldn't grasp it. Just like the woman at the well when Jesus said, I will give you living water. Well, give me that water so I don't have to come to the well anymore. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. they the, the, the Israelites' hope was in their biological lineage. They were related to Abraham. So they were God's chosen people by birth. That's, at least that's what their hope was in. They had their hope in the physical miracles of the past. Particularly in this discussion, they talked about the manna that came down while they were in the wilderness. Back in, back in the Old Testament, as Israel was, was miraculously rescued from Egypt, they're in, the, they're in the wilderness, there's two million of them. There's too many people to feed, and God miraculously brings bread down from heaven. Uh, this manna, literally manna means what is it? And they didn't know what it was, but it was like little granules that would be on the ground, and they would get up in the morning, and they would scoop it up. If they waited too long, it would disappear, it would melt. And they would take that, and they could grind it up, and they could make bread for it, and make bread from it. And what we read in the Old Testament is for 40 years, they ate this in the wilderness. And they look back on that, and they said, look, look God gave us, and actually Moses gave us bread from heaven. And this is where Jesus says, no, no, I'm the bread from heaven. And they, they have a hard time grasping that. And Jesus points out that the manna was a blessing, no, no doubt about that, but physical blessings are temporary. Physical blessings are temporary at best. He says, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I'm the living bread, the one that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. 
The bread that I will give him for the life of the world, or that I will give for the life of the world, is my flesh. One of the hardest things we can do in life is to look beyond the here and now. That's huge. That's an important thing. And if you want to have, if, you, if you're interested in having this discussion about who Christ is and what Christ did, you have to look beyond the here and now. Not entirely. We do live in a world of, of you know, we live in a concrete world. Uh, we do live in a world where Jesus literally walked and his death is a historical reality. His death and resurrection are historical realities. But we have to see more than just this. Certainly this is all we've ever known. I've never been. We talk about our citizenship being in heaven. And it is. If you're in faith, if you're in the faith, if you've trusted Christ, your citizenship is in heaven. You have a door with your name on it in God's house. But you've never seen it. I've never seen it. It's there. This is, this might be all that we've ever known, but it's not all that there is. And nothing here is permanent. 1 John 2, 17 says, The world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. This world's passing away. Uh, we often use that verse talking about sin in the world, but that's not even what I want to focus on. It's just this world is passing away. How many things do we have that have worn out? How many cars have we had to replace because they've worn out? How, much, how many pieces of clothing have we had to replace because they've worn out? My clothing doesn't wear out. It gets stolen by my children. But it's still, I don't have it anymore. It's gone. Well, no, it's uh, neither here nor there, I suppose. But we have things. This world wears out. Nothing is forever in this world. And Jesus reminded them that, yes, their fathers ate miracle bread and died. <laughs> uh, not immediately. It wasn't poison miracle bread, and they didn't eat it and croak over immediately, but eventually they died. The manna in the wilderness did not grant eternal life. It wasn't designed to do that. It nourished them while they were in the desert, in the wilderness. That was its purpose. It was a picture of a greater truth. And this is, <clears throat> again, another important thing to understand. The things of the Old Testament happened. They're, they're historical realities. But many of them were pictures of what God was going to do in the future. God provided bread from heaven as a picture of a greater miracle. Jesus would give bread that brings everlasting life. It wasn't granules picked up from the ground or loaves baked in an oven. It was Jesus himself. He was the bread of life. So these physical blessings are temporary. And this bread of life cannot be earned. It can't be worked for. But it does require commitment. Life in Christ requires commitment. Now, this, this might make some people struggle. I grew up in a church, several churches, but that taught that salvation was a no-strings-attached salvation. God had no expectations for you. God just wanted you to like him. And when you start studying scripture, that is not how salvation is described. Certainly, we can't work. We can't earn our salvation. There's no good works that are good enough to earn salvation. But we do, it does require commitment. Israel had to commit to gathering the manna at the right time in the right place. If they went out too late in the day, it already melted and they weren't going to get any food. If they, on, set, on Friday night or on Friday morning, they had to go out and they had to, they had to uh, gather twice as much. There was a certain amount they could gather during the week. If they gathered too much, it would get worms and it would go moldy. But on Friday, they had to gather twice as much because there wasn't going to be any on Saturday because that was the, the Sabbath. And they had to learn. They had to commit to doing things the right way. And just as Israel had to commit to this manna, so too Jesus requires commitment from those who would receive him as the bread of life. And this is where he gets into the nitty-gritty of this, of this verse, uh, or this passage, he says, truly, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. 
And he goes on and on. If you have your Bibles open to that, you'll see he goes on about, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now, Jesus is not demanding cannibalism. Okay, we'll set that aside right now. Jesus is not telling us to be cannibals. So you can whew, take the deep breath. It's okay. We're not going to, you know, nothing crazy's happening. Now, that was an early Roman misconception. One of the reasons why Roman, uh, the Roman culture, now there were, there were several reasons why Romans rejected Christianity, but one of them was this misconception that these Christians were cannibals. I heard they eat the, they eat the flesh of their leader. I hear they drink blood. And it really was a thing. It's a thing they, they thought. That's not what Jesus is demanding. He's not saying you literally have to drink my blood. Now, I could understand if you got a crowd of 5,000 without microphones, some guy in the back who's still munching on a piece of bread, you know, and what? What did he say? Did he say I have to drink his blood? I don't know. I could see some people missing the point. But that's not what Jesus is demanding. But he is demanding content, commitment and total dependence on him. This is the idea. You must feed on me. Your soul, your nutrition must come from me. Probably a, a, a good illustration, not perfect, but a good illustration is a baby. A baby feeds solely from his mother. He's dependent on her for all his nutrients, all his energy. Now, this is not a perfect analogy because we do have other sources of food. You know, if a mom can't nurse her baby, there's formula. Although this summer, like, you couldn't get formula. But um, normally there's formula. There's, there's things to do. Actually, in his history, you had what was called a wet nurse, someone else who would come and nurse the baby if need be. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an okay analogy of thinking about a baby. A baby feeds from mom. A baby can't get food anywhere else. Their body can't handle, you can't just give a baby a T-bone steak. They, won't, they, can't, they can't handle it. They don't know what to do with it anyway, but they can't handle it. Um, it is great when the kids get old enough to eat normal food, but uh, that's, that's probably the best example I can give. Maybe you can think of a better one, but this is what Jesus is demanding, commitment, you must feed from me. There's no other sources of spiritual bread. Jesus is the only source, the only way. He's the only truth, and he demands commitment. That's big. Uh, Luke says in chapter 14 of his gospel, well, Jesus says it, Luke is recording it. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, again, Jesus isn't telling you to abandon your family or to hate your family. He's not telling you that. But he's, he, Jesus is saying that he will not accept divided loyalties. You can't, uh, you can, you must look to him alone for salvation and sanctification. He won't accept divided loyalties. He, Jesus says you can't, ha you can't serve two masters. You can't, you can't serve God and money. He demands commitment. That's important for us to understand. Again, we have... I have grown up in a world where it was easy to make a profession of faith. Uh, most Americans, even today, profess salvation, profess uh, uh, to be Christians. I think it's something like 70% of, of Americans claim to be Christian. But we treat, we treat Christ like he's a, you know, Instagram or Facebook where we just hit a little button, like, I like Jesus, that means I'm a Christian. No, no, that's not what Jesus is asking for. He doesn't say, just like me. He doesn't say, just just uh, have a good opinion of me. He says, commit to me. See me as the only source of, of bread, the only source of life. Jesus is loving and merciful, but he's no pushover. He offers the only way of hope, but he, re he requires total commitment. Jesus will not be your co-pilot. Remember those old uh, uh, license plates? My dad had one when I was a kid. Jesus is my co-pilot. Um, see that? We, 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 we have that in our culture, the idea that you know, Jesus is going to help me. Jesus is the sprinkles on the ice cream of my life. My life is pretty good. You add a little Jesus, that just puts it over the top. It makes it. That's not what Jesus is. He will not be your co-pilot. He won't be added 
to your life, he must be your Lord. He must be your master. We've used that word. We've talked about that word at length. Master means owner. If you're going to be in the faith, if you're going to trust Christ, you have to recognize him as owner. There's a submission. There's a commitment to him. And because of the nature of this teaching, we see our second truth. The world will not accept Jesus' message. Not everyone who rejects the good news rejects it for the same reasons, though. The world won't accept Jesus' message, and there's several reasons why. In verse 36, we see that some people just outright dismiss Jesus. Verse 36 says, but, but I have said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Jesus says, you've seen me, but you don't believe in me. Now, you've, and what he means is you, you've seen me teach, you've seen me do these miraculous things, you've seen it, and yet you dismiss it. You don't believe. Jesus did everything right. He taught clearly. He taught with power. He supplemented his teaching with supernatural signs. Yet many people simply dismissed him. Most of us have tried to share the gospel with somebody, and maybe we've had mixed results. I remember as a, as a high school senior, we had a, a, a friend that lived in the neighborhood. He'd play basketball with me and my buddy, and we were getting ready to go to Bible college. And we just, this, this was an unsaved kid. He didn't know the Lord, and we wanted to share the gospel with him before, before we left. And um, we sat him down, <laughs> and you'd, you'd laugh at this point. We, we sat him down. And we realized at that point, at 17, 18 years old, I'd been a Christian since I was five. I didn't know how to share the gospel. We tried. This poor kid, you could see the look on his face. He had no idea what we were even talking about. And he was, he was gracious with us, but we were, we were not very clear. I, I still look back years, decades later, wishing I could be more clear, wishing I could go back in time and just say things better to him. But we see with Christ on this earth is he said everything correctly. He didn't walk away from any sermon going, oh man, if I had just said, hey, if I just put in one more joke, they would have got it, right? He didn't do that. He, everything was right. And yet some people simply didn't believe. They dismissed. And I use the word dismiss for a reason because dismiss is not a reasoned rejection. It's a refusal to even consider. Basically, there are groups of people that went, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not buying that. Without thinking about it, without, without dealing with this, what, what Jesus said, they just outright, nope. In Mark chapter 5, we see a situation. It says, and they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had, had had the legion sitting there. He was clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. So earlier in that passage, in healing a demon-possessed man, Jesus allows the demons to possess a herd of pigs. So it's kind of a, it's a supernatural event. Jesus finds this man who's possessed. He asks, who's the demon's name? The demon says, we are legion for we're many. There's many demons possessing this man. They say, don't send us to the abyss. Hey, let us, let us go to these pigs. And Jesus accommodates them, lets them possess the pigs. The pigs go nuts, run into the Sea of Galilee, and all drown. Now the townsfolk come in. They see the guy who had been just this insane demon-possessed man, and he's sitting, he's calm, he's at peace, and he's probably, there's probably like pig bodies floating in the, in the lake. They know something's happened. Something supernatural, something, something big has happened. But they want no part of it. They don't want to know what happened. Like, yeah, don't give me any details. You just leave and we'll go back and pretend this never happened. That's the picture of what, what's happening here. We don't want any of what you have to offer. Now, these people are hard to witness to. These people who dismiss, who, who, who just dismiss Jesus. Because for them, the door is shut. These are the hard-packed pathway that Jesus speaks of in his parable, the sower. And, uh, 
Actually, just, just very briefly, tonight in our evening service, we're going to start a new series walking through the, uh, the, the parables of Jesus, and we're going to start by talking about the parable of the sower. We're going to just kind of walk through the parable of the sower. If you're familiar with this parable, Jesus says, you know, the sower, this, this farmer plants seed, and there's some seed that falls on the pathway. It's hard-packed, seed doesn't get in, and the birds come and take it away. It never gets in. That's the picture of these people who dismiss Christ. There's no, the, the, the word, the message isn't sinking in. Now, we don't know if any of the people that Jesus is talking to in, in John chapter 6 ever came to faith. They may have. God may have worked. They may have come to faith. But the peop, for the most part, we don't know. And for our part, we are to live and speak the gospel. That's our challenge. We can't make people, we can't kick the door open to people's minds. So we live, we speak the gospel. We pray that God will churn the soil of their hearts. But that's these people who dismiss Jesus. But not all outright dismiss. Some reject the gospel. Some reject Christ's message because they can't comprehend the gospel. It makes no sense to them. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he say, we, he, I've come down from heaven? And then verse 52, he says, uh, the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us flesh to eat? They couldn't comprehend what he's saying. It doesn't make sense. We, we, you, Jesus grew up in this Galilee region. So he's up there by the Sea of Galilee. Nazareth is not too far from the Sea of Galilee. Jesus, this is Jesus' stomping ground. This is where he grew up. Many of these people probably knew him as a child. And they couldn't compute how this hick from Nazareth could be teaching like this. One of the things uh, uh, we've learned about the city of Nazareth, uh, is archaeologists didn't know how, how long this city existed because there are ancient maps that don't have it. And they thought, well, it didn't exist, except it did. It was just such a small, unimportant place that many old maps, just they didn't put it on. I mean, this is a backwater. This is a wide spot in the road. Prophets don't come from wide spots in the road. And so they're having a, they have trouble understanding, why, what is he even saying? I can't grasp this. Many were focused entirely on the here and now. It's easy for us to do. We all, we all easily fall into that. They were okay with him giving them miracle bread. But uh, once he stopped giving them miracle bread and started talking about this bread of life, they're like, no, I don't, want, I, I don't get it. Just shut up. Just give me some more, break some bread and get, make, make some more miracles. Do some more tricks. They won't see beyond their own fingertips. These people, they would not look beyond right here. Something momentous is happening and they can't see it. We see this in, in scripture, we see this in our own lives, but you think of the Israelites as they were being uh, delivered from Egypt. They walk through the Red Sea. The, the way the Bible describes it, uh, Moses holds out his rod, the Red Sea parts, the Israelites walk through on dry land. This is a miraculous event. There's no natural explanation. This is supernatural. The people walk through on dry land. Uh, they get through as the Egyptians are coming in. The water crashes back down. The Egyptian army and Pharaoh are killed. No question about this. God miraculously rescues them. And a day or two later, they're complaining. Oh, we're going to die in the wilderness. If only we could go back to Egypt. They missed it. God did something incredible in front of them, and yet they missed it. And we do that in our lives. We, we miss God working many times in our own lives. In Acts chapter 2, we see the birth of the church. Uh, beginning in verse 4, it says, and, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then move down to verse 11. Both Jews and Gentiles, proselytes, Cretans, and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they're filled with new wine. 
Now, if again, if you understand, if you know anything about this story, the Holy Spirit fills the, the disciples. They go out. These, these guys who had been uh, hiding for fear are now empowered by the Holy Spirit. They go out and not just preaching the word, they're preaching in foreign languages, miraculously, supernaturally speaking in foreign languages so that these people could understand. These people who, who under, you know, they had their home languages, they understood the gospel. God is doing something incredible. But there's others standing by going, those guys are drunk. And they missed it. They missed the birth of the church. They're in the right place. They're at the right time, but they can't see it. Luke says about 3,000 people heard the gospel that day and trusted in Jesus for salvation. But others hearing the same good news not only rejected it, but mocked it. And again, these are like the thorny and the rocky soils in Jesus' parable, the sower. There's so many distractions. There's so many things going on. They can't focus on Christ. They can't see what's right ahead of them. They ate the bread that he gave them. They enjoyed the show, but they couldn't spend any more time on it. Don't, don't ask me to spend any more time. Dinner's over. You gave me, you gave me magic, magic sky bread. Day's over. I'm going home. Now, we need to pray that God will remove the obstacles, that he will clear the path so that these people can see the truth. Now, some people, they're, again, this world rejecting the message. Some just dismiss. Some what can't comprehend. There's too many distractions. And there are some who reject not because they don't understand, but because they do understand and are unwilling to commit. Some won't commit to Christ. This, this is big. This is important for us to get. Verse 60, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Verse 66, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Some disciples, and in my notes I have quotation marks around disciples, they had been following Christ, but some understood what Jesus was asking of them. And they simply backed out. They said, no, I'm not up for this. I'll, I'll walk around, I'll eat the food, but you're asking for commitment and I'm not gonna do that. Now, Jesus is clear about counting the cost of discipleship. And one thing you'll, you, you will not get here in this church is an easy believism gospel. Certainly the gospel, salvation is a free gift from God. But Jesus is clear that you need to count the cost. We're not going to try to trick anybody. Hey, if you, if you say this magic prayer, God's going to give you the promotion you want. God's going to make your life easy. Honestly, that's not what Jesus promises. In Luke 14, Jesus says, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost? whether he has enough to complete it. Verse 33, so therefore, if any of you who does not, um, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Now again, Jesus isn't saying you have to take a vow of poverty, but he's saying you have to put him first. You can't say, Jesus, I will give you 90%. Jesus, you can have everything except for this closet. He doesn't give you that choice. And he tells you to count the cost. Are you willing to commit to him? Even some of the Jewish leaders recognized the Messiah, but they wouldn't commit. In John chapter 12, it says, Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. This is big. This is important. They knew he was the Messiah. They knew he was the promised one. The one they had been waiting for for centuries, they knew it was him. But they were more afraid of the Pharisees than of God. They were more concerned about the Pharisees than they were of God. And they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. So sometimes we use that word faith, we use that word believe, but we have to understand the context of what Jesus is saying. 
Satan believes that Jesus is God. He, he believes that Jesus is, is the Messiah. Satan's not saved. It's not, a fact of, it's not just the recognition of a fact. There's a commitment. There's a submission. And those Jewish authorities wouldn't submit. They knew it was true, but they wouldn't submit. Now that's hard. That, that's, that's just difficult to deal with. And even though, or, or but even though most of the crowd left, not all did. Most of the crowd, for whatever reason, walked away, but not everyone did. And this is because God leads people to the truth. That's our third truth. God leads people to the truth. He lovingly draws people to the gospel. Jesus says in verse 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Verse 40, this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on that last day. Verse 44, for no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Salvation is a miraculous event. We marvel at the salvation stories of the Apostle Paul. Uh, John Bunyan, who, not John Bunyan, I'm sorry, John uh, Newton. John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace. He was the captain of a slave ship. And he, write, he gets miraculously saved and he writes these, these incredible words. C.S. Lewis was an atheist who came to Christ. Many of you know his, his uh, Chronicles of Narnia. C.S. Lewis wrote a lot of theological books too. I mean, he, he wrote some incredible books. But he was an atheist that God brought to himself. The evangelist Billy Sunday was a base, professional baseball player known for being profane. And he got saved and stepped away and became an evangelist. Lee Strobel, who wrote uh, The Case for Christ, was an, was, was an atheist journalist, atheistic journalist. Uh, and he decided he was going to debunk the Bible and in studying the Bible comes to Christ. We, we marvel at those salvation stories. And probably some of you have similar stories about how God brought you to himself. But I want you to understand that our sin nature is so poisonous, it's so blinding that every soul saved is a miraculous work. It's a direct work of our loving God. That little kid who got saved, and I tell you my, my salvation testimony sometimes, uh, I was saved when I was five, grew up in a Christian home. We were getting ready for church on a Sunday morning, and my parents had a televangelist on TV. I can't remember which one it was. But he gave the plan of salvation, and I trusted Christ watching this TV preacher. Sometimes I'm hard on the TV preachers, but man, sometimes some of those guys brought it. And I, I put my faith in Jesus Christ that day. And sometimes it's easy to think, well, Jesus, God didn't save me from much because I was five. No, I was a wicked sinner. Every salvation is a direct work of God. It's a miraculous work of God. And God lovingly draws people to himself. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, who, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you've been saved. God's love, God's mercy draws people to be saved. He opens the eyes of people. Although we have all knowingly shaken our fists at God. And there can have some debate, some, some different theologians debate whether we're born sinners or we just sin, you know, that, that original sin. But we, if we're honest with ourselves, we have all shaken our fists at God. We've all done something we knew was wrong and did it anyway. Though we have all done that, God mercifully offers hope to lost men and women. He opens eyes and brings the dead to life. And this, this great salvation cannot be earned. It can't be bought. It can't be stolen. It must be accessed through faith. The gospel is accessed only through faith. Jesus says in verse 47, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. This is the gate. 
You must believe. You must put your faith in Christ. We've talked about the commitment. Not just the recognition of a fact, but a commitment, a, 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 that recognition. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Salvation comes through faith. No good work on our part could ever be good enough to offset our offense, our sin debt to God. There's not enough, you, you, you can't help enough little old ladies across the street to offset your sin. There are religions that talk about scales, and at some point you'll stand before the deity and you will, you will, you'll weigh your good deeds versus your bad deeds, and if you have more good deeds, you'll be okay. If you have more bad deeds, you, you're in trouble. The problem is, none of my good deeds, we, we overvalue our good deeds. You know, I helped an old lady across the street, so I get a million points. I told a lie, well, minus three, right? That's what we do. That's how we justify ourselves. And God is clear that, that there's no amount of good works that can offset our sin debt to God. Now, we must each trust Christ, commit to him in faith, trusting that his good work on the cross is enough to restore our relationship with God. We have to put our faith in his good work. He went to the cross, took our sins, took the punishment for our sins. Our faith must be in him. And now finally, as we, as we, we finish our, our passage here and prepare for the Lord's Supper, finally, as the crowd is filtering out, Jesus directly asks, asks the 12 their intentions. So most, the thousands have left, they've walked away, and the 12 are still here, and Jesus knows, knows the answer, but he directly asks them, do you plan to leave too? And now Peter has one of his great moments, and if you've been here any length of time, you know I love Peter. Peter's my guy, because uh, I resonate with him. He says some great things, he says some stupid things. And he has one of his great moments here. And again, no one has highs like Peter, no one has lows like Peter. But Peter says he recognizes that faith in Jesus is the only source of eternal life. He has this incredible moment of clarity. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. He says, where else are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. Now Luke says something very similar in the book of Acts. Acts 4.12 says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the only way. There is a way into a relationship with God, but there's only one. This is the only way into God's kingdom. Jesus is is the bread of life. He's the source of life. And through faith in him and contentment, we can have eternal life. Many of you here today, you, you've trusted Jesus. Many of, you, many of you trusted Jesus before I was born. I love talking to people who have been a Christian longer than I've been alive. It's incredible to me. Many of you have trusted Christ long ago. You've experienced the hope, the joy that comes with being an adopted child of God. Let me challenge you before we, before we go to the Lord in prayer. Are you continuing in that joy? Are you living every day in the sure hope of your salvation? Or have you drifted? Is this world crowding out your joy? Whatever the distractions are. Maybe it's worry. Maybe it's success. Maybe it's uncertainty. Is this world blocking your gospel witness? I want you to take a moment and I want you to talk to God. I want you to confess any sin. I want you to ask God for strength, for wisdom. Thank him for his grace and his mercy. And maybe some of you are here and you don't know Jesus as Savior. I never want to assume I'm talking to a group and everybody is a believer. Some of you may not know Jesus as Savior. Maybe you like Jesus, but you haven't committed. You haven't, you haven't trusted him with your life. Maybe you've, sit, you, you've never even considered it. Maybe, you know, this idea is just completely foreign. 
Maybe the gospel doesn't make sense to you. Maybe you've, you've heard it and you're like, I don't really understand it. Talk to somebody. Work through it. Ask God for wisdom. Maybe you're here and you know that Jesus is the way. You know that Jesus is the truth and he's a life. He's the life, but you've not been willing to commit to him. You've just said, no, I'm not ready yet. Well, now is the time to commit. Now is the time to repent of your sin and trust him alone for salvation. I'm going to pray, and then we're gonna, I'm going to step down. We'll have the men come forward as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. But I want to take this moment to speak with God. Lord, we come before you. We again thank you for just the, the, the grace that you show us in your word. I pray now for anyone here who they are believers, they've trusted you, they've, they've known the hope of salvation. I pray that you would strengthen them. I pray that you would encourage them. If we do have people here, if we, all of us have, have struggled, I'm sure, but if we have people that are, this world is distracting us, this world is crowding us and, 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 and pushing us, I pray for strength. I pray that you would open our eyes. I pray that we would recommit to following you. I pray for wisdom and strength. And I pray, Lord, for anyone here who has not trusted you as Savior, uh, for whatever reason, I pray that you would open their eyes, open their ears. We know that you are sovereign. You call people to repentance. I pray that you would bring them to yourself. Let us see people commit to you, begin that spiritual journey, uh, begin that new spiritual life as adopted sons and daughters of God. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.